Uh, how many of you are Twittering right now? My God, that's half of you. Excellent. Well, keep Twittering. Keep Twittering. Um, if you don't know what Twitter is, why are you here? No, um, if, <laughs> uh, this, what you're looking at is an application called TweetDeck. It lets you do things to the Twitter stream so I can see what people are saying. Um, right now, I get to see Amanda Sturgill asking about this futures market, which is a great question. If you click on that link, you will learn a lot. Um, I get to see a group of students, and uh, already Claire is very fast, wondering, but so is Rebecca. <laughs> I better keep going. Um, this is, uh, thank you all very much for coming tonight. I really appreciate your time. I know how busy you can be, and I know that you would rather be outside freezing to death. Uh, actually, it's really pleasant outside. Uh, I live in Vermont, up on top of a mountain, so this is like very t-shirty weather for me. Uh, we got up to 30, and we think it's a big deal. So, you know, being in 40 or 50 is just kind of you know, balmy for me right now. Um, I'm going to be speaking about a new movement called the digital humanities, and this is a, a pretty complex subject. Are you guys comfortable over there? If there, there are seats in the maximum embarrassment section over there, if you want. <laughs> okay, we do, we do with this. Okay, that's fine. Um, and you can hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we can now. Um, digital humanities is a movement that's sweeping academia in certain sectors. And most of you are students. You may have encountered bits of it, but not with that name. So what I'm going to do is explain the movement, show you where it came from, ask you questions about it, and hopefully show you some examples. And I'm very, very keen to get your feedback. If at any point what I'm saying doesn't make sense, if I use an acronym or a strange term or what the sentence I said sounds like it's in Swahili, please stop me at any point. I come from the liberal arts tradition. We believe anything is a discussion. And I don't want to simply lecture blah, blah, blah and not hear from you. And of course, as an English professor, if I don't hear from you, I will call on you. Now, one thing, um, as you Twitter, if you guys have questions or comments, I'm going to try and keep up as best I can. But first, I need to show you a PowerPoint stack. And I know how happy that makes you. Uh, we, we actually had an experiment. We thought that people would be happy to see PowerPoint taken out behind the garage and shot. So we did an experiment to see how many people would, would really want something beyond it. And we were really surprised. Uh, almost nobody did. We talked to a lot of colleges. And we said, well, what alternative do you have in mind? So let me ask you guys. What do you use instead of PowerPoint? Anybody? Prezi. 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 Wow, is it Prezi Chorus? That was pretty good. Makes you want to kind of animate around it. Anything else? Google Docs. Google Docs, yeah. Yeah, what was it? Ziga. Ziga, really? Very cool. Anybody use Keynote? No. Oh, see, no one loves Keynote. Even Mac, <laughs> even Mac guys, right? Yeah, it's so different from PowerPoint. It has, it's PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> but no one wanted to go beyond it. And I think one reason is we tend to expect PowerPoint no matter what. Um, so I'm giving you this, but also because I use PowerPoint whenever I break the web. If I show people the live internet and it doesn't come up, then I feel stupid. So I'm showing you screenshots of what happens. Now, one thing to think about, um, if you don't know my organization, I work for a very 21st century group. I work for a nonprofit called the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education. There's about 10 of us. We're scattered across the U.S. I'm in Vermont, we have two staff in Texas, we have some in Michigan, some in Seattle, and we use the internet and all these technologies to keep up with each other, which is a lot of fun. We do a lot of things working with small colleges and universities. Uh, we help them build communities of practice, we help them do research, we try and keep an eye on the emerging tide of cyberculture and translate it to these small colleges, which is a lot of fun. Um, I think personally, my best preparation is that I read lots of science fiction as a kid, and that really helps. Um, if you don't think science fiction helps, you absolutely have to read the right stuff. Uh, if you watch the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, the main characters have an iPad. Uh, if you take a look at the original Star Trek, which is still the best one, uh, characters have smartphones. They have tricorders and communicators. Uh, if you like British science fiction, there's a great novel from 1972 or so called Shockwave Rider, where in the far future, People communicate with each other via computers that are connected by phone lines. Bad programmers called hackers write programs like worms that crash things. They have virtual gambling and schools online. Pretty good for the early 70s. So why you want to look at science fiction and see what it's doing now. That might tell you something about the far future, like, say, September or October. <laughs> I 
over the next few minutes, I want you to keep four themes in mind. And only one of these gets a picture, so you have to work hard for the three others. The first theme I want to hear reverberating through all this is that when we talk about the humanities, we're talking about the impact of digitization. Not just digitized manuscripts, but also the whole transition from the analog world of print and face-to-face -face to the digital environment. And it's affordances. Affordances means what they enable you to do. A hammer has the affordance of being able to whack nails pretty efficiently. You know, an iPod has the affordance of letting you listen to sound. So think about the affordances of all these technologies. A second, digital humanities has a slightly political stance. It tends to be pro-open, pro-social, and pro-public. Uh, it's kind of anti-silo, anti-walled garden. Another is, I want you to think about how technology changes. Here's one, one model. Janet Murray argues that whenever there's a new technology, we have two stages of adopting to it. The first stage, we take current practices and we copy and paste them onto the new one. Um, do you guys remember web pages with numbers on them from the 90s? They're actually pages, and you can see, and click on the number of a page. If you watch early film, black and white silent film, it looks like a stage play. The first great Frankenstein movie begins with a curtain across the screen. And Usher comes out and tells you why you and the audience should be afraid. That's the first stage. The second stage is when we take the technology and we run with what it can do uniquely. So you look at early film and they figure out they can actually pick up a camera and move it around or do special effects or cut and move. Now, with computer games and a few other developments, we're beginning to see that second stage. I want you to think about the stages of this when we think about academia and how scholars can adapt. Here's the fourth one, the only one with a picture. This is a visual metaphor from geology and from architecture. It's called imbrication. And it refers to a way a certain pattern of rocks fall out. If you look at this photo, you can see that they overlay each other with a slight overlap. So that if you look down from above, part of this rock is obscured, and part of it is revealed. This is a metaphor for how we use technology. When we get a new technology, it blots out some old technologies, but leaves some of them remaining. Uh, how many of you guys have ridden a horse in your lifetime? That's 19th century technology, right? It's actually 10th century, but we still have these. If you look at World War II, the great age of mechanized warfare, people were still using mules and horses to get around. The technologies of the new don't completely blot out the old. So as we're talking about the onslaught of digital technology, think about not what all is just effaced and erased, but what remains exposed, what remains available for us to use. Now, where's the best place in the world to get definitions for terms? Anybody? <laughs> of course, Wikipedia. <laughs> where else would you go? Um, this is the current definition, <laughs> last night's definition of uh, digital humanities. <laughs> So, you know, it may have some of you are ch probably changing it right now. Um, the whole Stephen Colbert trick, I know. So, this is one definition of what we're talking about. It's an area of research, teaching, and creation concerned with the intersection of computing and the disciplines of the humanities. It's not bad. It's not bad. It goes a little further, bring us some history. Developing from the field of humanities computing, which is a different term, Digital humanities embraces a variety of topics, ranging from curating online collections, which I'll show you, to data mining large cultural data sets. That's a little more detailed and it breaks it down. When you hear digital humanities, it's plural because there's no one particular method, no one straightforward way of doing it. This is a more detailed explanation. This is from the Digital Humanities Quarterly, which suggests that it's a diverse and still emerging field. See, Wikipedia makes it sound so stable encompasses the practice of humanities research in and through information technology and the exploration of how the humanities may evolve through their engagement. This is the killer thing. This may sound kind of abstract or removed from daily life, but what this definition argues is that digital technology is changing the humanities. When you think about history, English, foreign language, philosophy, what they do, who they are, is beginning to warp, bubble, and shift under the impact of digital technologies. It's an extraordinary thing. Now, because this is a humanities topic, and because I'm a humanist, you have to have some historical background. 
And here are a couple of details you should know about. Is that a flip camera? Oh, it's great. It's amazing how quickly those became antiques, you know? I, I love them. <laughs> it's such a cool, it's such a nice tool. And do you use a Mac or a PC to edit? Mac. Uh-huh. And it works just fine. I love that. So in the 1990s, a few major American universities like Princeton, like Rutgers, like University of Virginia, created what they called humanities computing centers. So these are places where you could go if you were a humanist, and you want to get some computing done, basically. If you want to try to digitize something, if you want to create a data set. In 2004, the term digital humanities pops up. There's a wonderful, have any of you seen this book, The uh, Companion to Digital Humanities? Oh, it's really good. It's this thick. It's huge. You know, you put it in a table and it cracks the legs. And it's all out of date. Um, the, it, it was the first book to try and encompass everything that people were doing in the humanities of computing all in one fell swoop. And it rapidly became out of date, and they put the whole book online for free. And what's fascinating about it is they came up with a title kind of on the spur of the moment. They weren't sure what to call this stuff. And they ended up calling it Digital Humanities. And one of the things that came out of it was one technology was the most successful, the most powerful, and the most persistent. Let me ask you, 2004, throw your mind back. If you're thinking what technology would be most useful for the humanists, what technology would you think of? Anybody? Please. Email. email. That's a great idea. I thought you were going to say chalk. But email is good. <laughs> yeah, email is extremely, I'm not just for peer to peer, but I don't know if you've known this, there's a huge amount of professional humanities email lists. Are you on any HNET listservs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great. I mean, I used to run one of them, HUtopia. How about you guys? Ha ha ha, you thought I forgot you. What technology <laughs> would you pick that most humanists would be using? Which technology? I already said chalk because so you can't use it. Or text messaging, good, good. Should computers or text messaging, good. Wrong, all of you. The answer is the text markup model. TEI is the acronym for this. So you know when you look at a web page, there's text, and you resolve the web page, and it resolves in different formats. You get different fonts and headers and bold, that kind of thing. But according to this book, over decades of work, marking up text was the most effective way, which sounds crazy, but it really, really works. Now, a little further forward, it was a good guess, but 2005, 2006, anybody here in the sciences or engineering? Not a one? A one, brave man. What's your role in the sciences and engineering? Excellent, excellent. Um, do you use, ever use the term cyber infrastructure? Do you use it at all? I don't use it. Now you can. <laughs> What's your name, brave man? Jeff. Jeff, nice to meet you. Did I see you earlier today carrying a box of pens? Uh, pens. I bought them in bulk. Pens in bulk. Very clever man. Very clever man. <laughs> Keep an eye on this guy. <laughs> if you need a tracheotomy, he's your man. But um, <laughs> I've ruined him for life. 2005, 2006, the National Science Foundation did this great report where they argued that anybody doing science work, even in computer science, need what they called cyber infrastructure. They need all the tools, all the piping that would make digital communications work. That included people as well as pipes. It included video technology and great videographers. It included people to train you as well as people to keep networks running. But this was the sciences. When they did this, a bunch of humanists and social scientists said, well, what about us? We should have cyber infrastructure too. And they pushed a giant report out and said, we should claim this because we need it, because we need text messaging, and we need more email, and we need other stuff but we're not scientists, so we're not quite sure, so please tell us. And they had a lot of money spent around this. This began to push us towards the idea of having digital humanities across the US. There's more background, and here's the key one. The National Endowment for the Humanities is a federal office that gives money to humanities projects. They're a really great group. They spun out an office of the digital humanities, which is still working today, one of the most influential sites of this. So if you want to work in digital humanities, they may have money for you. And according to the sequester, they're so far okay. They haven't closed up yet. Now, what does this stuff look like? What can it mean? One piece of digital humanities is the creation of archives. Digital archives. I mean, humans have made archives since the Library of Alexandria. A lot of us make personal archives, digital or analog. But some of the big projects in digital humanities produce digital archives of material for different purposes. 
This is, I'm sorry, an ill-lit shot from one of the great ones, the William Blake archive. Uh, if you don't know Blake's work, Blake was a master of both text and image. He constantly painted and also engraved and physically produced his books from start to finish. So this archive takes these books, digitizes them in multiple forms, and makes them available to you for free right now. So if you'd like, you can stop listening to me and look at the Blake archive. Might be a better deal, we'll find out. Why does this matter? Because the books are tremendously expensive. Decent editions of these run up to $100 a piece. They're physically huge and heavy and you have to schlep them around. Now, you can get a whole bunch of different versions of these all in one spot. You can search them, you can compare editions. It's extremely useful for scholars. There are a lot of these different examples out there. Uh, classical studies scholars have put in a ton of texts that are now freely available. Uh, there are uh, images. Some of you who are interested in quilts should know the Quilt Index, which has an incredible archive of quilt imagery. Uh, a, a liberal arts college in uh, the west coast of the US has a ceramics digital archive. There are maps, data, video, audio, all kinds of archives. And all of these are free for you to play with. Now this is important for other reasons beyond just having access to these. I mean, one is that they draw attention to archives and they let you work on them. People who are interested in the archives are excited about archive theory and editing. Another thing about these is that we can play with how to render access to them. So for example, who here has a Flickr account? A few people. It's okay, you should be proud. Yahoo hasn't killed it yet. It's an important thing. <laughs> Library of Congress had a bunch of images, photos from the 30s and 40s, color photos from the 30s and 40s that didn't have any metadata. So they put these on Flickr for the whole world to see and begged people to add metadata. What's going on in this photo? What year do you think it was taken? What are they doing in this picture? It was a way of crowdsourcing information so they could improve their archive. When you make these digital archives, you now have these affordances where you can ask people in the world to help you. That's pretty exciting. Now, another thing you can do is make the digital archive the go-to place for a source. So for example, the Whitman archive of Walt Whitman's poetry and letters is now the go-to place for anyone studying Whitman. Graduate students, high school students, scholars, undergraduates. Uh, this right now gets tremendous amounts of hits. It's a world resource. Uh, it lets you play with, with resources in there more than you could otherwise. And uh, it also lets people know about Whitman. It's good for uh, PR. Now there are problems with doing this stuff. Uh, copyright is still a major issue. Uh, some of the technology challenges are big. Uh, and also, it's hard to get funding, especially in the recession. A different approach. If you have all these archives, if you have digital content, what can you do to it and with it? One thing is to use new tools and new methods. Um, how many of you are really good with directions, spatial directions? And it was a mix of male and female. That's unusual. <laughs> Usually it's all men. Oh, yeah, I never get lost, of course. Um, <laughs> And then the women get to laugh at them. Um, we have in the humanities now, thanks to digital technology, what some are calling the cartographic turn. Uh, it used to be that we thought that, di that humanities caught objects, plays, poems, books, existed kind of without space or without time. But we're finding now that with digital mapping, we can take that content, play it against a map, and learn more than we did to begin with. Anybody here a Civil War buff? Nobody? Is that illegal? I mean, <laughs> okay, good, all right, excellent. What's the battle fought outside of University of Mary Washington, Fredericksburg? Do you know that one? I'm from North Carolina. Oh, <laughs> I understand. No, no offense intended. Um, it's been bugging me. I can't think of the name of it. I'll find it eventually. That's it? It's not called like the Battle of Culp's Hill or Bloodthirsty Pit or anything? All right. Um, this is an example of the cartographic term. In Civil War studies, one thing that people are trying to understand is how black slaves were emancipated, how they were freed, because the process is still not very well understood. One way of understanding it is to figure out when slaves were freed and where. And historians before the internet called these emancipation events. Either the slaves rebelled, freed themselves and left, Union troops came by, something else happened. Well, what you can do now is you can take these events play them across the space of the American South, and over time, 
and see what happened. You can try and get a sense of what may have caused these events. So for example, did the emancipation events, these little red dots, do they follow Union armies? So were armies the main cause of black liberation? Do they tend to cluster in certain locations? Did something happen that we should know about that we wouldn't have known otherwise except for this map? Civil War historians love using this to try and figure out what was happening over time. High school students, college students can use this to try and grapple with this pretty complex problem. And you can play with this. You can add or subtract data. You can move it back and forth in time. What was happening in September 1864? You can do this kind of approach with all kinds of events, not just war. Uh, for example, the Salem witch trials. Some of the best scholarship has been done by taking the events in Salem and mapping them out. So you figure out where all the accusers were from and where all the accused were from. So maybe it was a north versus south within the small town. You can add another layer of mapping to that to see what the soil was like. Did the accusers run out of soil? Were their farms bad? So they need to raise money by attacking somebody else. You can use maps now, digital technology, to get more information about the past, which is a pretty extraordinary development. What technology do you guys use for footnotes? I know it's your favorite subject to talk about footnotes. No, no, if you're doing a citation, what program do you use? I'm sorry? Easy boot? You just looked up. Brute force, right? You, you write each one down and <laughs> that works. <laughs> what department or what major are you in? Excellent, excellent, very good. Favorite movie about journalism? All right, you'll think of it later. Uh, broadcast news is eh, I think. You should see Network, though. That's great. Have you seen Network? No. Go home and watch Network. Ask anybody over 40, and they will tell you. It's true. And they'll start <laughs> quoting it. You'll get creeped out. <laughs> anybody here use RefWorks? Man, the enthusiasm just came off of you like, yeah, I use RefWorks. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> Bibliographic citation can be a pain, especially if you do a brute force or if you use a tool that you don't like. A group of digital humanists created a footnoting tool called Zotero, which is free, plugs into your web browser, and automatically scoops out bibliographic information from what you're looking at. So if you go to an Amazon.com page, you think, oh, I need that book about bibliography, hit this one button, Zotero, out comes author, comma, title, city, publisher, date, all that stuff. It's a free tool. This kind of tool would never be built by a company for free. Come on in, guys. I saw you. Uh, and you can sit in the back or anywhere. There's plenty of room. But they made this for free for academics because we need this for education and actually makes our life better. Uh, one nice thing about Zotero is that you can save all of your citations to the web. So if your computer catches on fire and burns, you can still have copies of it. Here's something else. Right now, some of you students may not have seen this, but you've already helped pay for it. Scholarly communication, how scholars publish information and share their research, is, is in a terrible crisis stage. One reason is it has become hugely expensive. When I say you've helped pay for it, I'm not kidding. The price of scholarly journals is through the roof. Is anyone here from the library? We have one scientist and lone librarians. This is like the greatest humanities mob I've seen. Um, scholarly journals are an incredible price point. They become more and more expensive, and there's no alternative to them. Uh, the most, one of them actually has a great name, Elsevier, which sounds like a Mexican masked wrestler. Um, they're very expensive, and yeah, Elsevier. Yeah. Um, and they're not widely read, and we don't know how to keep paying for them. Monographs, full-length books, are less and less often read, more and more expensive. All of these are the gold standard for scholarly communication. We're in a terrible crisis about this, and we're not sure what to do. One possible solution is to crash the business model, invent a new one, and give it away for free or for very low cost. So we're talking about using the web. It's brand new technology. It's not that new. It's from the mid-1990s. To try to reinvent everything we know about scholarly publication, to change the way that we have research and invention shared. We might be able to do something strange and exciting with the open web beyond silos. 
There are a lot of examples of this. Uh, how many of you are WordPress fans or WordPress users? <coughs> okay, have you guys used Comment Press? Ah, you should see this. Okay. This is a WordPress plugin. If you haven't used WordPress, it's a very popular free blogging tool. What Comment Press does to it is it splits it in half. The left side of a page is your primary content, a report, a poem, whatever you like. But comments get skewed to the right. They're not put below it, but they're put in another column. So you can read through the left and see what's being annotated on the right. Like one of those great editions of Shakespeare where you can keep looking horizontally to find what the words are. You can go through here, and then you can click on a commenter and see everything they've said. Follow them down. You can work through it like this. Why does this matter? It's a great way to comment on a document, which is really useful for all kinds of purposes. Plus, this is a good way to do peer review. If you put out an, an article, you think you've invented a new property of Jello, you want to put it out there for everyone to see. You need reviews from other good scientists. If you email them copies of this, eventually, months will go by, you'll get feedback. Here, you can put it on the web for anyone to respond to, professional scientists or just anybody else at all. We may have just doubled the power of peer review, hopefully made scholarship smarter for no cost, which is a tremendous, tremendous change. We've been doing this with other journals as well. Uh, it may be that we take multimedia and we actually plug it into scholarship for the first time. This is a great journal about Southern life and Southern history called Southern Spaces. And already smoothly plugged into this, images, sound, video. It's not fiction. This is all scholarship and studies about Southern history and Southern culture. But it's smoothly integrated in multimedia fashion. It feels like something you would peel off of your iPad. It's been around for a couple of years already. And this is very, very different from scholarly journals. Now, let me show you one more thing, then I want to ask you a question. Another thing we can do is interpret digital content. That's what humanists do in many ways. So we interpret the cultural record of humanity. You know, historians look at the past, literary scholars look at documents. But here, we might be able to take a look at others. Have any of you guys used the n-gram set from Google? You've got to see this. This is a tremendous, tremendously bizarre and powerful tool. I'll pull it up right now. Yeah, Google Books. Google digitizes all these different documents, all these different books. A lot of them. Millions of books. A tremendous amount of pages. You see me at PowerPoint? I can slow down the web by touching it. <laughs> and the more people who look at it, the slower it gets, right? You know that it's a law? It's a pretty, um, come on, thank you. Well, they made that one enormous data set. So you know when you do Control F, or the Apple version of the Command F, and you can search through a document for a keyword? Here, you can search through hmm, 200 years of the written word for a word. So we can type in, let's say, um, oh, that would be a good one. I'm sorry? Picky, picky like a picky eater? That is a pretty vivid image. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I can track this over time and see how often it's used. Here's another one. I'll take the word fascism. And you know, there's a spike. <laughs> it's funny. It happened around 1940. <laughs> Surprise. But check this out. It comes back up in the 1970s. I mean, there wasn't a widespread outbreak of Hitler clones in 1975, but you wonder what this could be. At a quick glance, this actually tells you something to look at. It points something towards you. And of course, it goes up around 2000. Who knows why? This could be interesting. I study Gothic literature, and so I'm always interested in words like Gothic and horror and romance. So I'll play these three against each other. So around 1800, Let's see, what's this, is Gothic the blue line? Yeah. So it was a big deal from 1800 to 1820, we know that. In British 
literature and American literature, that was the golden age of Gothic horror. And then it drops down. But there's a little spike in 1850, which makes you want to go back and see what happened. Was there, were there reprints? Were there new authors? And it trickles along. In 1900, it goes up, plummets in 1920, and so on. Horror, though. People love horror. It's much higher up. And then it just goes down steadily. Romance trickles up, does pretty well until 1900, then it plummets too. So you can basically do a quick literary history by typing in a few words. It'd be pretty easy to play other terms as well. You know, for example, just to be uh, brutal to you guys, North Carolina, Virginia. Oh, actually, I have to, sorry, I have to use the, uh, the actual phrase. I'm sorry to tell you guys. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's try and be a little more fair here. <laughs> Whoa, you guys are neck and neck. Look at that. <laughs> and you wonder, 1940 again, Virginia. What is going on? Yeah, please. How wide is the library? How? A lot right now. This is from the Google Books project where they were scanning everything they could. They used about three or four major research university libraries at Harvard and Michigan. So it's a mix. It's fiction and nonfiction. They're trying to get everything published in English from this time. Uh, it's not complete, but it's the biggest in history right now. If you go to the Google Books page, they'll give you a detailed background of it. Hey, hang on one second. What's your field of study? Excellent. Excellent. So imagine doing this and playing it against some of the archives of newspapers, trying to see you know, where terms come up. Would there be a difference between books, what they cover, and newspapers? This one, this set, doesn't, but they have digitized a bunch of newspapers. And you know the expression that news journalism is the first draft of history? It would be interesting to see if you can track where terms go back and forth. Hang on a second. She had her hand up. And you that was my question. Okay. And you are? Uh, my name's Shana. Right now, not yet. You have to fiddle with it a bit more, and they may be producing more output for it. I can see where you're going. Are, are you a journalism student as well? Yes. Good question. Yes, sir? Virginia. Does that separate the name Virginia, the female name Virginia? Aha. Uh -huh. That's how you're thinking. As well as the name Carolina, you have to wonder. But presumably, a big chunk of this are people named Virginia. Or dogs named Virginia, or horses named Virginia as well. But yeah, and that's a problem. I mean, if you're trying to think of total uses of the word Virginia meaning the state, yeah. You'd hope. You'd hope. Good question for the man with a fine beard. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I must have saw this bad news about Virginia. <laughs> Where are you from? Virginia. <laughs> it's a self-hating thing, right? Are you, are you from the coast or inland? Oh, I. I understand. I understand. And your accent changes when you say that. I, I know. I guess. So, you can play with this in all kinds of ways, and think about archives like this for other. I mean, radio journalism. It'd be wonderful to have a ton of transcripts of classic radio and sift through it, or television, or movies. And some of you may have used tools like this to make word clouds. This is part of the digital humanities, and there are more tools like this popping up all over the place. I'll give you a couple more examples. Humanists are prone to saying that we can criticize the human culture. We view the record of humanity with a critical eye. We look for weaknesses and strengths. We look for abuse as well as potential. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, photo, by the way, I'm very fond of. This is Anais Neen in her diaries in a bank vault. Um, and if you think you write a lot of diaries, that's a lot of diaries to look at. So perhaps the humanities can give us a criticism of the digital world. We try to understand what's happening between Facebook, Pinterest, Tumblr, mobile devices, and gaming. Maybe the humanities can help us think about all of this. So there's a photo over there on the right. Has anyone here read Rainbow's End? 
Okay, faculty, administrators, you guys should really take time for this book. It's a science fiction novel taking place about 15 years from now. And it takes place in a high school and the college. The main purpose of this book is to figure out what high schools and colleges would look like in that future. The main character has Alzheimer's, and they figure out how to reverse it. So he's having his memory and his thinking come back. And it turns out that A, who's a great poet, and B, kind of a son of a bitch. So he's unpleasant to be around, and he's trying to figure out how to think. And he has to go back to school and put it together. It's a fascinating, fascinating book to anticipate some issues. Now, we also have the field of new media studies. Some of you may have taken classes in this already. We also have the long tradition of the history of science and the history of technology, where we go back and look at how did radio change things. Newspapers, when were they invented? When were they first able to have an impact in society? Plus, literature, even beyond science fiction, is often looking at technology and how it changes things. You know, Don DeLillo, for example, has many books about the impact of TV on everyday life. Now, we'll put all these together. I'll put all these together and stop with this amazing picture. This is President Obama on Reddit.com. If you don't know Reddit, it's a social media site where people often hold different topics. Here he was answering questions from anybody. It was a, a purpose called AMA, Ask Me Anything. And if you ask me anything, I'm the President of the United States, Barack Obama. People asked him things like, you know, so what's it like being president? Are you going to send a drone to kill me? I mean, they asked all kinds of questions. What do you think about the economy? But let me pause there with that dizzying image that feels so science fictional and yet so ordinary and ask, what do you think? What does the digital humanities feel like to you now? I took your picture when you were like, what does he mean? Now you know a bit more. What do you think? Is this a force for good in the world? Is it dangerous to the humanities? Does it have absolutely zero impact on your life? What do you think? And don't be shy. I, mm, maybe you should be a little shy. He's recording this. Yes, sir. It's OK. Tell me your name and what you're studying. Oh, definitely a dangerous sign of a bad character. Excellent, excellent. So, do, I don't know, could you hear George's question? I mean, so there's a question of, of, I was describing the humanities in terms of description, where the humanities is about interpreting um, the world and the and the record. But you're talking about it in terms of transformation, how the humanities can better the human race. Do you know Marx's quick throwaway line where he says the point is not to interpret the world but to change it? So you're, it's a good line. It's from the thesis on Feuerbach. So you've got an echo of that. So that's one answer. The digital humanities may enable humanists to help make the world a better place through making better humanities artifacts. Good question, or good comment. How about the rest of you guys? What does this mean? What do you think? We could hear from faculty who may have a professional interest in this. OK, go ahead. You looked at me. <laughs> what field are you in? Yes. No, no, him, him. It's okay, I'll come back to you. What field are you uh, in? I'm uh, in mass communication. Great, great. And um, I've just been sitting here since we were thinking about the uh, uh, academic journal. Yeah. And uh, of course, the great need to switch them online mm -hmm. and to make them open and available. Uh, but the next question is what about books? Great question. Why, if we're going to be creating new books, especially in the field? I'm sorry, did you say buy or bind? Bind. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is there really a need anymore for unchanging manuscripts? Could you guys all hear the really good question? I've been talking primarily about other media, and I, haven't, I don't think I've said the word book very often. The question was, if journals, which have short content, you know, articles, reviews, if those go online, that's one thing. But what about books? What does it mean to make them digital? I mean, what does it mean to free them from the prison of time? Uh, there was a great uh, project at Connecticut College where they brought in scholars to bring fields up to date. And then they digitized all their discussion. It was a wonderful project, but they wanted to put them on the web. However, they were afraid that they would have to keep updating them forever until the heat death of the universe. 
So they figured, all right, we'll just burn these on DVD and publish them, and then they're done. The DVD was like a printed book. It's there for all time, and it's locked in place. It's a good question. Some e-books are there to be revived and revised over time. Uh, some of these are not. I mean, my Kindle, most of the books are basically PDFs. Well, not technically. They're actually EPUB or Mobi, but, they're, but they're, they're static files. They can't be changed that often. So it's like it hasn't changed that much. But monographs or reference books, that sounds like something. I mean, how about, do any of you guys read e-books? Does this sound familiar? Yeah? What do you think? You're the only person here who has more hair than I do. You've <laughs> got to speak now. <laughs> Uh -huh. it's, it's, I think my ebook, I, I have a Kindle too, and it's uh -huh. practically paid for itself. Yeah. Because yeah. the books that you buy are cheaper, and like you get all the classics for free and stuff like that. So. Can you guys hear her okay? You're you just waving your hands. Can you hear her? Okay, I'll come back to you in a sec. So it pays for itself. That makes a big difference. Um, it's beginning to do it. Right? What's your name? I'm sorry. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, who does have awesome hair. Thank you. Um, <laughs> how about you guys? In the, up against the wall. Yes. George Lucas. <coughs> yeah. I was making fun of George Lucas, which is easy to do. I just said his name. That's funny. But, um, but a lot of directors do, uh, do this. Um, Ridley Scott, for example, has how many cuts of Blade Runner? Um, and uh, Apocalypse Now, I've lost track. I'm just did one more about 10 minutes ago. And I should make one right now, right? And that's the other thing is remixing, which I haven't gotten to, right? Um, so maybe the movie version, at least the default one, where it's there and it can. You know, there's the one definitive version of Argo. Maybe that's the idea. So maybe we'll see a split between the fixed and the fluid, you know, the iconic and the unstable. And what do you study? Uh, cinema and creative I noticed a trend in your comments. That's very good. I want to push on because there's still more in this. But I'm glad for your feedback. Did you guys have something? Were you just going to say, did I miss you? You just left my peripheral vision for a second, and you know, I couldn't tell what you were doing. Social media. Uh, how many of you are on Facebook right now? Right now, this second. The hands are kind of unstable. Well, with this hand, yes, but um, <laughs> uh, just, just a quick poll. How many of you are, on, not right this second, but in general, how many of you are on Google Plus? Oh, well, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Wow. Watch that number, guys. That's a big deal. because. That's bigger than it is in most other places. So A, you guys are cool. And B, Google Plus might be really trending up. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Oh. What's the song? We are the world? Wow. <laughs> All right. So I don't have to talk to you very much about social media and why it matters in the world. Um, in fact, you guys are already telling me about it on Twitter right in a second. What does this matter for humanists? Just so you know, if there are three big divides in academia, the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. The humanities tend to be the last ones to get technology. Right? The natural sciences tend to invent it or run with it or absolutely need to do their work. The social scientists grab it in different ways depending on who they are. And the humanists eventually get to it and are cranky and unhappy with it. But, but there are exceptions. In the world of social media, tons of humanities practitioners and graduate students and faculty and researchers have been using social media for all kinds of purposes. So for example, we don't talk a lot about the blogosphere right now, in part because it simply works. It's robust. It's huge. It changes lives and politics. OK, it's no longer sexy. It's just industrial strength. I mean, right now, it is, we know it's hard to keep track of how many bloggers, for example, are arrested and or tortured and or executed by governments for blogging. We're used to that now. When I first started looking at blogging about 10 years ago, people said, are you sure it's going to be a big deal? It is, simply put. But for scholars, they can meet each other. They can talk to each other. So for example, here, this is Crooked Timber. It's a blog dominated by political scientists, sociologists, and economists. There's very little math. A lot of discussion of policy and books. And the discussion is high-octane stuff. Imagine the faculty lounge scattered through cyberspace involving the entire planet. They often have arguments of politics in Australia, Britain, Russia, and the United States because they're all from there. 
There was this expression in the early scientific revolution uh, that scientists were involved in the invisible college, a college knitted together by correspondence and affiliation. And now we're seeing the visible college. We're seeing all that science and all that work being done out loud. In fact, some people have to do it out loud. The United States invented a category called the public intellectual. This means people who are scholars who leave the Ivy Tower and go out into the world and share what they're doing. Carl Sagan's a good example, a scientist who goes out to tell people on TV or wherever about the importance of science. Here's another example. This is a uh, historian who has the most stressful job possible. His chair forces him to study the intersection of religion and politics. So it's either very stressful or the easiest job in the world, because all he should just do is keep hitting print again and again. Um, he's at a small college, Trinity College, and he uses a blog because this is the best way for him to quickly analyze current events and draw attention to them through his own scholarly method. One of his colleagues, a political scientist, was so beloved by his students that when they graduated, they came back, bought him a domain, bought him a blog, taught him how to blog, and made him do it because they wanted to hear his thoughts about current events. They missed him that much. You can have public intellectuals influencing the world right now. And then that social media enterprise can then turn to face-to-face -face conversation. So have any of you guys been to an unconference? A couple? Yes. Man, you're everywhere, man. Well, which unconference was it? Oh, good. Good. Where was this? In San Francisco. Oh, appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. If you haven't seen this, if you go to a conference and they have a bunch of people in suits in the front of a hall talking, let me think about it. If you have a, an agenda with a whole program built up and you get to see a bunch of tracks, that's a normal conference. An unconference, some people show up and they make up the conference on the spot. You have people who are interested in journalism or in technology, and they all have interests and questions and expertise, and they want to share what they're doing. And there are various techniques where they come up with an agenda right there on the spot. If you haven't been to one, I really recommend it. It's extremely exciting, very low cost. And often people are very satisfied because they actually built the thing themselves. So we have a whole series of unconferences called that camps for digital humanities people who get together and study a particular subject. So January before last, we had a that camp gaming a bunch of us who study computer games and their role in academia. And we went there, we made up the program on the spot. It's a wonderful way to get to meet other people in digital humanities, combine your forces, learn from each other, and network like crazy. This is a VAT camp for 18th century literature, some of the most staid and conservative parts of British literature. And they could do it. You can also use social media to have new forms of storytelling. So, for example, has anyone here read The Diary of Samuel Pepys? Really? You're hardcore, man. Why would you do this? This is great, but I mean. Oh, that's how it starts. <laughs> the fact that nobody else admitted it is, is actually pretty typical. This is a guy who lived in the 1600s. Um, he was a small official at the court of Charles II, British monarch. And he did something really weird. He kept a diary. Like a nice neat, tons of paper, right? Um, and it's extraordinary. If you read it, he lived through an amazing time. London burned to the ground. A plague swept it. An enemy fleet sailed up the Thames and really seriously trounced the British fleet. They had a coup, a near revolution, a near civil war. A usurper took the throne. All this is described in daily detail. Plus, Pepys is an interesting character. He eats, he drinks, he has sex, he goes back home to his wife. I mean, he's a really interesting figure. And this is one of the most unteachable documents in the 17th century. Because he writes it without paragraphs. He writes it for himself. He doesn't footnote his own work, right? He, he, he assumes you would know who Lord B is and everything else. So if you go to the Norton Anthology of English Literature, there's like this one page. Right? It's, that's all you can get. That's all you needed at a time. <laughs> Yeah, you do. <laughs> the whole text is in public domain. It's out of copyright. So you can do whatever you want with it. So a computer programmer took the entire diary text, put it through a blog, so that every calendar day, 
an entry would appear from that calendar day in 1661 or 1662. So you could follow it through day by day. And this became a hit. This became widely read because broken down to that format, it became understandable. You could see what he was doing. If he was sick one day, tired the next, finds a friend, gets in a fight with a friend, eats terrible food, gets sick, sees a ship going down the Thames, doesn't know what it is, it becomes like reading a soap opera. Thousands and thousands of hits, and the book changes when you read it. Because people start commenting on it, and they start asking questions. Who was that woman? Or answering questions. You had experts in London geography who say, oh, that one inn where he went to? Here's where it is. This morning I went down and took a photo of the building where it was. Here are the GPS coordinates if you want to come there. Thanks. Now this whole book is the richest, most annotated and powerful version of the Peeps Diaries and the most readable. Next year is 1914's 100th year anniversary. I'm expecting several bloggers to start blogging World War I day by day. August 1st, next year, what was happening August 1st, 1914? and you can follow along. Full disclosure, I did a version of this. Has anyone here read Dracula as an adult? Oh, you gotta read it, it's an awesome book. It's a messed up book. It's a, doc, it's a scrapbook. The whole novel is all different entries dated, starting with March, I'm sorry, with May 3rd. I took the whole book and published it through the blog. Many, many hits, many readers, people reading it for the first time, and reading the book actually changed. It felt more exciting, it felt more mysterious, we had first-time readers who'd leave comments like, is Mina okay? What's going to happen to Jonathan? And we had scholars come out of the woodwork and offer things like, well, when I was in Philadelphia reading the handwritten manuscript, I found this. Here's a photo. Thanks. Yeah, question. What was, what was the blog? Dracula blogged. A very unimaginative, and there's no web design involved at all. I stole one image and put it there, and that's it. Yeah. It is a form of serialization, but the book itself wasn't serialized. Right, so you, what, what's changed? Is it because I have to wait every day for a nap? <laughs> That's a big deal, yes. That changes the dynamic? That changes the dynamic because it's not only one every day, because you'll get some days where a flurry of posts will appear, because there's more than one entry. So they kind of build up in time, like in a film with multiple cuts. And then you'll have days or a couple of weeks go by with nothing which is like a, two, you know, a cliffhanger from a TV show. What could possibly happen? And a lot of that we didn't, weren't fully aware of. You could do the math and put it together, but to actually experience it was really exciting. We're kind of re-serializing something or serializing it for the first time. You can do this for a lot of different texts. Here's a different one. I haven't been talking about teaching and learning very much because I want to save that best part uh, for the end, how you can use digital humanities for teaching and learning. And there are all kinds of ways. Some of the faculty here will be familiar with this chart. Um, this is a bunch of pedagogical practices that we call high impact practices. And studies show that students, including you guys, benefit tremendously by these kinds of things. Learning communities, diversity, global learning, internships. And what's funny is some of these are used in digital humanities. Collaborative assignments, service-based learning, undergraduate research. And for example, we found that when people study digital humanities as students, the syllabi tend to look pretty similar. Lots of student projects. So for example, the University of Mary Washington had a project where students fanned out across Virginia. Sorry, I've got to mention it. But this is in Northern. This is middle, right? And they went to historical markers, you know, roadside markers, and this date, this thing happened, GPS them, built a map out of it, researched them. So they built a kind of database of you know, this, this form of history, and then corrected them. A lot of the markers were wrong or in the wrong place. And then turned that data over to the state and said, hey, you guys should fix this. They could also, if they want to get really meta, figure out when those markers were placed, which is actually interesting. When and why did those people get suddenly very interested in that form of history, which is pretty exciting. We see a lot of digital humanities is blog-based. So people love having this information out there in the world. And it's also a nice fusion of theory and practice. I mentioned the Whitman Archive, and this is one of the great ones. You may have experienced or heard of network classes. This is when multiple classes in multiple campuses happen at the same time. I taught a class like this on the American War in Vietnam. I was teaching a class in Louisiana literature. There was a class in Florida that was in political economy, and a class in Richmond, Virginia, doing Vietnamese history. 
We had the same syllabus, and our students read the same books and argued online frantically about absolutely everything, network class. They took the, the Whitman archive and used this as the basis for classes in two different countries. So three schools in the US plus one in Serbia. They all discussed Whitman's poetry and letters. They were first year students, they were grad students, and they formed a kind of pop-up sudden global discourse about Whitman's poetry and how it could work. There's nothing really quite like this. Arguably, what happened is that when you use digital humanities in the classroom, you change from having students as passive receivers to students as contributors to knowledge, co-creators. This is a long and hugely wordy quote. I'm just going to put it up here for you to read because I don't want to read out. I'll read out that. It's our experience. The closer we can bring our students to the real sources of knowledge, so not textbooks, right? not handouts, but papyri, <coughs> ancient texts, archaeological remains, the real world reward of scholarship, the joy of producing a piece of work that one knows will be discovered and read with pleasure and interest by people we met, have never met, the closer we can bring students to the experience of being true scholars. Working beside other scholars, the more enthusiasm we find. What a wonderful hope for this kind of pedagogy. And there are a lot of examples of this. I want to move to a serious issue of how we actually mount this kind of thing. Because there's a lot of detail, and I'm conscious of time. I'm wondering how small colleges can do this. See, way back at the beginning of this lecture, I mentioned that it was Research One universities, like Stanford, like the University of Virginia, that were doing digital humanities work. Well, what about the rest of us? How about the other colleges and universities? How about Elon? How can you do this stuff on your campus? And we found a bunch of ways. I'm going to touch on a few of these, and then I want to hear from you. There are challenges, right? If you don't have staff who can do this, if you don't have money, if you don't have infrastructure, you can't afford it. If you don't have a building, a lot of these schools that do digital humanities, let you have a center, a building or a part of a building, a lot of staff, a lot of resources. It also can be invisible. People might not know about it, and practitioners might not be known on campus. There's one person who works in classical studies and they do this, and the person in French, the person in philosophy, don't know them. Well, here's how they've done it. If we go to the University of Richmond, the one who did the emancipation visualization, they figured out that they were going to pick a very, very narrow focus and nail themselves to that. So they were doing civil war in southern history, which is a big world, but it's narrower than the whole humanities. They focused just on that. They could also take pre-existing technologies, pre-existing infrastructure that was already there. They can combine with other curricula, and then they make stuff up. A very DIY approach. They do it themselves. And plus, they use pre-existing tools. A lot of open source, a lot of free tools, a lot of stable tools, or they build things. So I mentioned text markup. A few of these small schools actually built a web service so you could do text markup and keep it on the web for them. Or you collaborate. We've seen schools pair up or triple up or form little valleys of digital humanities work. Now, beyond that, we find this kind of dizzying prospect. Remember before about those two scholars who said that digital humanities could make teaching more exciting, could make learning more enthusiastic? This is even crazier. Perhaps more of the specific modes of analysis that it offers, the kind of openness and collaboration that has always been a fundamental value for digital humanities, may be its greatest gift to the rest of the humanities. See, I asked if you guys were on Twitter, and now I'm going to find out what you've been doing. Uh huh. Uh huh. Dracula fans. Is Carrie Ann here? Whales are awesome. I agree. Uh huh. I'm just going to ignore you and read this. No, this is pretty good. But um, digital humanists are huge fans of Twitter. They, in fact, often live on Twitter and spend a long time building up all kinds of conversation on Twitter. So, for example, uh, if we were to search for the great acronym DH.
you can pull out comments and questions as you go. People share a ton of information about their practices through blogs, through Flickr, through Google+, through all kinds of ways. And you can find a tremendous amount of digital humanities work people are sharing openly. What you're looking at here, anybody know what technology this is? Who said that? I was hoping a student would say this. Is RSS going away? Ah, this is an RSS reader. You know, the joke is, what does an RSS reader do? <laughs> Let's you read RSS, right? Um, but here I'm looking at a bunch of blogs by people who write and put together digital humanities work. And you can find out what's going on in the field. Alison Byerly's point is, the humanists, we've forgotten how to do this in some ways. We can become really focused on what we do or not, we don't really share. We're bad citizens of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. We forget to share with people so much. <coughs> Digital humanities might make the humanities come back to life and become more vibrant. There are a lot of ways to get started in this. There are a lot of ways you can work on it. But I want to pause for a minute, actually. I want to ask you what you think. That's, yeah, please. Don't stab me through the throat. No, I'm kidding. Well, the opposing viewpoint, I guess. Please, and please. Remember, I'm the computer science major, so it's you're the fine. only one. You're <laughs> surrounded, right? You're the black swan in a sea of white. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. The different one. Oh, uh, okay. So, anyway. <laughs> um, so, if all of this information is available digitally yeah. and online, open source for free, yeah. Does the value of the physical campus become Great question. Off? Great question. Could you guys all hear that? Because it's a I terrific question. I know Elon is worried, for example, about the digital, the possibility of the digital education. Sure. That's why they're putting such an emphasis on like per in person human interaction. Which is a good idea. Almost everybody in education, K through 12, higher education, is worried about this. Uh, especially State governments, boards of trustees, campus leaders are really, really nervous about this. You guys all heard the question, right? There are a couple of different answers. First answer, much of what I <coughs> talked about wasn't instruction or instructors, but content and materials. So we're talking about books. So we, these are, in some cases, improved books, improved articles, improved course materials. That's good, but it doesn't replace the instructor. So if you took a class with me on the digital 18th century, for example, I'd have all these materials, but my perspective wouldn't necessarily be there. You go to my blog, but it wouldn't be my blog of teaching this class. It wouldn't be a record of everything I did. It'd be my thoughts on various things. Now, digitizing a class, having all of that. So the wonderful videographer in the back, I had to compliment him also to turn off the camera. If he's videoing my class for a semester, well, that's in the can. And then I have all these materials. Then maybe you can take the class. Right? And if you do, well, Think about it. It might be an inferior experience. It might not be as good as being in person. It might not be as lively, all this kind of thing. But it'll probably be cheaper. And it might be more accessible to you. You might be able to view this at any point. In that case, it might be better. Or it might be just one choice that you could take. If that's the case, higher education itself may be facing something like an existential crisis. We may be at the point where we'll see fewer colleges or fewer classes on different campuses. That may be. I'm putting this in conditions because we don't know. We don't know what the value is of this. It might be that's partial. Uh, you're a computer science major. Were you anything else before computer science? Communication. <laughs> They're not going to let you out of this room alive, are they? <laughs> yeah. Think about people who are terrible at math, right? math folks. Right? Um, and hands go up, right? Because it's, it's a traumatic emotional thing. Um, <laughs> if they have to take a math class, they don't come to it with joy in their heart. Right? They come to it with fear, trepidation, loathing, depression. And if you could say to them, you could take a wonderful face-to-face -face class with this glorious professor or spend 10% of that cost and take a class online from Harvard, I, I bet a lot of them would take that second one. So it might be that what we see is not your great computer science programming class, for the class you don't want to take. Right. Please, go ahead. Something happened with the newspaper industry. People thought that they would still be paying for the higher quality content of the newspapers, but instead people are going to be cheaper and do it online. 
So what's happening to the newspaper industry? What? What's happening to the newspaper industry as a result? People are going online for free and newspapers are dying. Right. That's what I said before. Higher education going to die off? When I said fewer campuses. Or few, uh, dying off, probably not. The worst case, we haven't seen newspapers die off. We're seeing it die back. They're shrinking in number. Right. Right? So it's possible that instead of having, how many nas truly national newspapers do we have right now in the US? What would you guys say? Give me a number, some, one of you guys. Three. Three? Four? OK, let's say we have one. Right? It may be that we only need one. That the Washington Post, the LA Times, the New York Times, that we only need one. I'll see you. You can put your hand down. I'll come back to you. I don't want you to lose all blood and become some kind of lifeless stump. I know, in terms of white. And it's Dracula, right? Yeah. Um, it may be that we see fewer campuses as a result. We have around 4,701 institutions of higher education in the US right now. I launched, I'll put it up. It may be that we go down to 2,000. It may be that these campuses remain, that we have more than 4,000, but they're smaller. You know, maybe they have fewer classes, maybe they have fewer faculty. I don't say this with joy in my heart and excitement. I'm just saying this predictably. You might be right. But again, I have to put the conditional, because this is a field which is being disrupted, but fields have been able to recuperate. Music, for example. Right? So you're familiar with Napster and the story of that, right? Do you know about mp3.com? Anybody here? Who here is studying copyright? You know about mp3.com, right? No. <coughs> Look this up. Very, very, very important. This is the first thing that scared a lot of us about music. mp3.com was a website where you could take songs you bought, store them on the website, and download them later. They were destroyed. They were found to be illegal. It wasn't sharing. You couldn't share these songs. They were only for yourself. Right? That's when that got attacked. Then we figured out things were going to get really, really ugly. But the music industry didn't die off. It bounced back through iTunes and digital rights management. It was able to sell music, and it's doing great. I mean, they complain because they complain. It's rising back in the digital form. Yeah, <coughs> but they but in back digital form and not losing money. So it's possible that people will pay for this. Possible. I'm not sure. Hang on one second. There are two questions. I'll come back to you. But this poor woman is dying of, of exhaustion right now. Tell me your name again. Shana. Shana. And your question. Make sure. Turn that way so they can all hear you. Okay. Um, so, kind of on the same point as what Jeff was talking about, it seems like we're getting into this digitization of books and music and classes, as we mentioned, and even interaction from face-to-face -face encounters going online with social media. With the foresight that you mentioned at the beginning of the speech, where does this stop? Do you think <laughs> it after all? That's a terrific question. That's a fabulous question. Um, <laughs> I think about that for a sec. Because <laughs> now I'm thinking big, big picture, like 2015. No, um, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a really great question. I mean, are we seeing something like an ontological migration where we are putting more and more online, uh, where we are increasingly digitizing ourselves? Um, there's precedent for this in science fiction. Um, but I think ultimately we haven't figured out how to transcribe our brains completely online. We don't know how to upload the personality. Some people think we can. I think that's actually a hard limit right now. So it may be that we're bound by the limits of our wet brains and we can't go much further. Um, but it may be that we do hit a limit of comfort, too. It may be that people want face-to-face -face conversation in some root way. I mean, how about you? What would you not do online? Yes. I, mean, I think it stops with capturing the individual, which is why I personally don't think that a class could ever be online. A, a true, like a true environment, a true class environment, like traditional mm -hmm. class environment, could never be online because it has so much to do with the interaction and the personal face to face. So this would go back to that second model, the, the post Napster MP3 model. Yeah. Yeah. Do you make food? I do. So you get information online. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you use the online to make stuff. Maybe you order ingredients, but ultimately you can't digitally cook. But I wouldn't, yeah. for, with that example, if you were to make something based off a recipe, mm. it wouldn't taste the same if you were to eat something and try and create it 
based on the way that it tasted. Do you see what I'm saying? I think so. Do you ever use a bread machine? No. Good. Uh, I think bread machines have one seriously good purpose. It's for people whose uh, hands don't work very well anymore, who have arthritis. Uh, otherwise, ah, don't use a bread machine for crying out loud. God. Um, and in part because I don't think it tastes as good. Right? But, you know, but you know, really make bread. Um, I mean, that's a difference. This is a huge question. And if you're not reading science fiction, you probably are. Read more science fiction because you're thinking this is where they're going. Somebody here had their hand up. I'm, I said we'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am, right? Oh, tell, me, tell us who you are and what you're studying. Emma, I'm an uh, education major. Oh, great. What, do you, what part of education do you want to go into? I'm majoring in special education and Excellent. You will have a job for a long time. <laughs> That's a great question. You guys all heard that, right? This is, in, in many ways, I, my answer would be about 14 hours long because I work in this all the time. I mean, this is, and a lot of people around you are actually been working on this for a while. Um, one way is to start small and incrementally and try something that you haven't tried. Pick it for a purpose, you know, something you want to see how it could work. So um, for special education, maybe visualization or using other media, sound, visual, animations, and then see how it goes, test it, and if it works, keep doing it. I do believe passionately that if you do that, share your results with people. Whatever way you can. A, a conference paper, you know, a YouTube video, but some people can see that. So somebody else is teaching special ed, they would love to know about what your experience is. Try something more. And then listen hard to your students and how they respond. I think that's really the answer. I mean, you can try and fling everything to your class at once, but then ultimately you won't be teaching much special ed or, or, or teaching much Spanish. So you have to be careful with that. That's a great question. I'm glad you're asking. Someone else had a hand, <laughs> phantom hand syndrome. No, yes, hi. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a question. I, have, I want to know your perspective on it. Sure. Um, with all this stuff going on in mind, uh, newspapers, music, what is your opinion <coughs> on hyper-local mm -hmm. stuff? Like the culture, I feel like a lot of culture has become more hyper-local. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's possible to overdo it. I think it's possible that you can blow hyperlocal. So did you follow the Bay Area hyperlocal blowout that Dan Gilmore, Dan Gilmore did? They tried to produce a massive Bay Area hyperlocal news source, and it flamed out. Also, their money went away. Um, pretty bad news. I'm sorry, in the... A couple of thoughts. Um, first, I think it's really, really important to do this. It's really important to have hyperlocal news because, in part, we're seeing newspaper guys. It, the, the big decline of the past 30 years was two newspapers per big city down to one. Right? We're really losing a lot of local information, and TV news doesn't really do a good job of this. And so now we have a chance to do more digitally to get hyperlocal news. I think it's very, very important. Here's an example. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this outfit in the in North Carolina or wherever you are from. Uh, Front Porch Forum is um, a service. It's based mostly on email, where they build a little group, a virtual community for people in a block or in a very small area. And it's not for any earth-shaking news. There's people doing things like, I'm looking for a ride to the grocery store. I found this missing cat. Um, somebody stays up too late at night partying. Will you help me tell them to be quiet? Um, and what's amazing about this is people love it. And by people, I don't mean geeks. I mean senior citizens, I mean working mothers, I mean people across the US who use this. And amazingly, this makes money. They're not blazingly Silicon Valley rich, but they more than pay their bills right now. Um, so this is one way to go forward. Here's the dark side. Do you guys have uh, patch.com here? Have you heard about this? <sighs> I'm trying not to share my opinions, but this is one that bugs me. Um, <laughs> this is um, hyper local. 
that you pay somebody else that's not hyperlocal to do to you, I mean for you. Um, so basically, patch.com gets somebody somewhere on the web, they find your zip code, they zero down to your block, and they surf the web for all kinds of information, and they publish it. Uh, I guess it would be useful, but for me it feels kind of like faux hyperlocal. It feels like a, a fake idea. Yeah, please. In your own area? Yeah. So, yeah, Good. they let people contribute. And were the locals outnumbering the other people or vice versa? I think for the most part, the lo it was mostly contributions. From locals? Mm -hmm. Where was this? Serena Park. Where's that? Maryland. Okay. Do you want to zip code? <laughs> no. <laughs> no let's, are you inland or on the shore? Um, lots of crab cakes, I know. Um, but this is, um, that's good if they do that. And if they do more of that, then that would really work. Then I, if there's more examples of that, then I would retract my, my objection and I'd be much happier as a person. But that would be a good example of a hyperlocal. Um, here's one more example to look at. Actually, I'm going to stop showing you things because I keep doing that. It's just a reflex. I don't want to show you things. But I think that's really, really important to have. Now, think about this from a digital humanities perspective. Uh, what's something spectacular that happened within a 20 mile radius of this campus in history? It's not a trick question, I'm actually asking. Yeah, please. Like the Greensboro sit-in? Great. The okay, so imagine. You guys all have smartphones, right? Or fairly intelligent phones, or you know. <laughs> By the way, the opposite of smartphone is feature phone. <laughs> not dumb phone, don't let anyone say that to you, right? So what if you go through Greensboro, and what if you could point your camera of your phone at different locations and pull down photos from the 1960s? What if you could take your camera, your phone out, and get street information for what the city looked like at that time? And you could find certain locations, sound files, video clips from film from the period, stories, accounts. You could walk through the area, and using augmented reality, that's what this is, to immerse yourself in the time and then put the phone away, all that history vanishes like a dream and you're back in the present. You can bring it back, back up. Imagine doing this at Gettysburg. Imagine doing it in New York City. Imagine being able to stand in downtown Philadelphia and surf through time, pulling down decades and centuries. Imagine doing that in Rome or London. That's one of the possibilities of the hyperlocal. More questions, more comments. More fatigue. And oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Tell me who you are and what you. Great. Oh, yeah. That's a great question. That's a great question. Have you ever done an MP3 tour? Ah, uh, uh, uh. Um, have you guys heard, heard of these? You, you go to a museum and you get an iPhone or a, an um, iPod. That's what they're called. Um, and it has an MP3 file of where you're going. And it says, okay, you're in the front door of the museum. Walk forward, turn left. Now you're looking at a giant statue and you do this. And I'm very bad at these because I don't follow directions. So I'll ignore the statue and go wander around. That's useless and I throw it away. But, but those are very popular. They used to be done before MP3 players with cassette tapes, and you go, go around. And those were antisocial, <coughs> completely abstracted out. You walk around, you'll see people going around. You guys know a little bit about schizophrenia and MP3s, right? You just put, or, or phones. You could put a you know, phone clip on your ear and start talking to yourself, and people think you're having a conversation. You should try it, see what happens, right? Um, but these are profoundly antisocial. I think what I described with augmented reality is different because it's up to the user to figure out when to do it. So if you are taking me through Greensboro, I'm just picking on you now, um, and you're want, taking me through and showing me things, I could, be, I could choose to be rude and pull the, and that's very good, uh-huh, and listen to something. Or I could wait and wait until he's done as we walk a block and then pull out the phone. I think that would be more sociable and more useful. Um, in fact, I'll give you one, one example. I was talking with one student today about the Murmurs Project from Toronto. Is that student here? 
Yes, it was you. Yes, ha, 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 you were hiding right in the front row. So here's an example. What these guys do is they have audio stories that you get by going to specific locations. They first did this in Toronto. There are a lot of examples of this throughout the US now. But you walk through a city, you go to a park, and on a bench there'll be a sticker. And the sticker will have either a QR code, you guys know from QR codes, right? Or there'll be a URL. Whip out your phone, take the photo or type in the URL, and listen to the story told at that park bench. And it could be the story of their first kiss. It could be the place where they first learned that Elvis was dead. It could be just a moment where they had a profound vision of beauty and the frailty of human life. Those little murmurs are placed throughout a city. And again, it's a little, you know, you could listen to these on your own or with people. I mean, this form of augmented reality can really, really go places. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Where do you want to go into? What, what medium? TV? Radio? Yes, sir. Make it better, okay? Please. <laughs> All right, my question has to do with the topic of human interaction. So as um, the years and the minutes go by, we are able hmm. to be more in contact with each other without being in contact with each other. Hmm. So what, did you see, what do you see as the future for social etiquette? <laughs> That's great. Did you guys all hear this? Do you know the expression netiquette? Ah, uh, you should. Netiquette is a term that goes back to the 1980s. It refers to the etiquette of being online. So things like, you know, using all capital letters is considered shouting. That's an example of online etiquette. There's nothing in the technology that says that, but we're used to that. I think it's a great question. Um, and a lot of it is emergent, what happens. Uh, what's the worst thing you've seen with a cell phone, with someone using a cell phone? The worst thing. What's the worst thing you've seen? On a cell phone? With somebody using a cell phone. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, in terms of etiquette? Yeah. Talking at dinner or being at a restaurant, I mean, that, that's kind of bad. Yeah, yeah. Have, have you guys seen it, experienced anything worse than that? Yeah. So somebody texted at a funeral. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did they take a call? No. OK. Any other bad examples? Snapchatting during face-to-face, -face. yeah. Uh, there was a, um, uh, a wonderful performance of uh, a very, very sad, beautiful meditative violin piece called The Meditation from Thais. And I saw, this, I saw a video clip of this, and the guy playing this, and the audience was rapt. And the music is, is crystalline and heartbreaking. And as he was playing, somebody's phone went off in the front row. And you could see the violinist look down. <laughs> And then he played the theme of the phone back. <laughs> now, a friend of mine was in New York City watching a movie. Someone's phone went off, and he answered it. And two guys on either side of him picked him up and threw him into the aisle. Um, oh, let me ask you, okay, snap, Snapchat question. Here's a Snap question. Who's more likely to use a cell phone, to talk on a cell phone in a bathroom, men or women? Whoa. People are thinking about it. <laughs> Except me. <laughs> um, I actually don't know the answer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how you could, the polling for that would be kind of tricky. Self-reporting is kind of limited, right? But just wonder when you call someone and it's always raining, just think about it. But, um, but I've, I've seen a lot of this. It's really depressing. But I think the etiquette for phones is beginning to change in the U.S. We're beginning to de develop things. And it, it depends on where you are. So if you're in some countries, if you're in Italy or Israel, People are happy to talk a lot during movies, for example. In the US, we tend not to do that as much. Um, you think about the use of phones for other things in face-to-face -face conversation, when that's OK, when that's not OK, I think it's emerging. But if we see each other less and less often, if we have the mediation of technology between us more and more often, maybe we'll become more formal. We'll use sir and madam more frequently. Maybe we'll ritualize greetings. Now, the opposite happened in Finland. Uh, Finland, in many ways, kind of the birthplace of the mobile phone, Nokia. In Finnish, 
they're like a lot of Native American nations. They don't like small talk. They can't stand it. It's actually proverbial not to use small talk. But on, on cell phones, you have to use small talk. Hey, are you there? Can I see you? Can you hear me? Are you okay? What? What was that? And it's changed spoken Finnish. The language is actually different now. And old people hate this. It's actually corroded the language, they think. So my answer is, yeah, all kinds of changes are about to happen. And look for some of these. Um, somebody else had a question? Yeah, you again. Short, short question. You're a fan of Google Glass, aren't you? Uh, let me take it off. Uh, <laughs> I'm really curious about it. I, I really think it might work. I'm really, I'd like to try it and see. Um, I think the opposition to it is really fascinating. Um, I'm waiting for the first bad things to happen. I'm waiting for the robberies. I'm waiting for the you know, head injuries. Um, I think Apple fans will make a special point of hating it because the Google Apple war is really passionate right now. Um, I think it's transformative. Uh, have you seen any video shot from it? We've never seen it before. That's phenomenal. Uh, one guy was actually doing a video. You guys all know Google Glass, right? The computer built into the glass. Well, he, he, was, he was whirling his child around in front of him, and you could see it from his eyes. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Um, there was a fashion video where they did catwalk vision from the point of view of a model. So already you felt kind of anorexic. But, but, but as you were walking back and forth, we've never seen that point of view before. So I think it's potentially very transformative. And I love teasing Apple users, so I want to get more of it, of course. Good question. Um, you guys look like you're about to die, pass out, or fade completely. So let me release you with a promise that I'm still here. I'll be here to talk. So if you do want to keep talking, please, I'd love to hear from you. Um, federal law. I don't know if you know this. It's very, very important to know this. By federal regulations that exist nowhere except on the internet, um, you can find that every single PowerPoint presentation must end with uh, URLs. Um, and if you don't know that, it's really important to know that, you know, because if you've been violating that rule, who knows what kind of trouble you'll go into. Um, but if you uh, would like to get in touch with me, if you'd like to find out more about me, um, if you'd like to just bug me or ask me, you know, how to read Dracula, uh, these are places you can find out about me. Um, I'm off on Twitter, email works, the web works, and you all work. I appreciate your questions, your comments, your thoughts and especially your enthusiasm. This is exciting and challenging stuff. Thank you for your attention and good night.